So what I'm going to talk about is, is really uh, the, the range of data that we have in the OCD uh, health database. Um, a quick run through of how to access those data. Uh, some examples really of, of why these data could be interesting to, to this, uh, this competition and the kind of things that could be done with it. Uh, within that, what other kind of data sources could be linked to it to make it even more interesting. And then uh, a bit more information about if you need further further contact with us here about the, the database and how to have some further questions. within the OCD Health Database, and these range from a lot of indicators covering such things as health status, that is life expectancy, mortality, um, what people think of their own health status, uh, going through some of the, the risk factors that, uh, that affect our health, such as tobacco, alcohol, uh, consumption, obesity rates, for example. Then more into the, the indicators and data which describe the different uh, health systems across OSD countries, even in OSD countries. So this could be in terms of what the, some of the physical resources are, uh, the number of doctors, the number of uh, uh, nurses and, and graduates coming into the system, as well as some of those more physical resources such as hospitals, beds, types of uh, technological equipment that are, that are used within the, the health system. Uh, other areas that we, we cover include the, some of the activities within the, the health system as well, you know, the number of, the number of uh, discharges or number of times that, uh, that people see uh, a GP or a, or a specialist doctor across different countries and, and the comparison between the two. Uh, to explain a little bit more about what's included, we obviously we're, inclu we're interested in looking at what is the actual outcome of, uh, for patients. So, in terms of you know what kind of care do they do they receive? Uh, is it safe care? You know, are they getting care at the right time? Um, and then I won't go, to, go into all of it, but other areas cover pharmaceuticals, the long-term care. Uh, sector in terms of the number of people receiving long-term care and the kind of resources available for that. Uh, the, the financing of the health sector as well, an, an important part to look at you know, what are the differences across countries and what is being spent on, on different types of care or on pharmaceuticals, etc. So that gives a, a kind of overview of the, the broad range of the, the different modules within the, the database and within each of those sectors there's a, there's a whole list of indicators running into hundreds of different different variables across them. So if I move on to the next part, how do you, you access the data then? The, the, the OCD Health Statistics forms part one theme within the overall OCD.stat warehouse of data. Uh, there's a, there's a, a link directly to the health statistics part of the, of the database here on the screen. Look at what we do also with the, these indicators. As I said, there are, there are many tens and hundreds of different in indicators within the database, and we as the OECD try to select some of those key indicators. data across the different domains. Several of the indicators can also be available through the main OECD data portal, which, which is available from the main OECD uh, website. A little bit of background to you know, what is the source of all this information. I said it's, it's a huge uh, scope of indicators, and, and most of this is collected through official sources from from the countries that uh, are members of the OECD and some of the, the other key economies around the, around the world. And we, we tend to collect these through uh, regular annual data collections through the use of questionnaires. Through our contacts in typically in the, in the health ministries and statistical offices uh, across the globe. Uh, a number, it should be pointed out, that a couple of these uh, collections focusing on expenditure and financing and, and some other areas of resources and health system 
uh, characteristics are done in conjunction also with uh, the European Union and, and WHO Europe as well. So this, the, OECD, the resulting OECD health database, which is updated every year, really gives you a, a comprehensive source of statistics on, on the health and healthcare system to the OECD countries. And it's used by many analysts and, and policy makers to, to look at comparative analyses uh, across uh, different health systems. This is not a new database, this has been around and has been well established for the last, for, for about 30 years now but forever growing and going into new areas of health statistics when those become more pertinent and relevant to, to current policy needs. So I said all these data are collected from all the OECD members, which currently is 36 countries, as well as some of the key economic partners and accession countries who will hope to be members of the, the OECD in the future. I'll just show uh, just a, a few examples of, of what we could do with the data as well. Uh, taking some of the different aspects from the database, we can, for example, be looking at uh, the way that health expenditure is growing across the OECD countries. Uh, examples of the number of uh, physicians and comparing across different countries. And these are the, the kind of charts that we put together both through our publications and uh, online in different, different ways of visualizing the data as well. I think an important part of the, the competition here is to, to take this kind of data and try and link it with other existing databases as well to get a better, a better idea of, of the power, the power of the, the different data sets. disease control, uh, some of the Eurostat data and WHO data as well is incorporated into this uh, OECD data. And across the OECD as, as a whole, there are many other areas that uh, health data can be linked to in terms of uh, social and employment, or in terms of the economy and, and the different uh, breakdowns of the demographic structure as well. And of course, these can also be linked with uh, national sources of data as well, which are already available. So to, to finish up with just an overview, really, of where you can visit to get more information about everything you need to, about OECD health statistics, and allow, allows you to get direct access to the OECD.stat data set. Oh. There's also the, the area for we're getting some of the key indicators in an easily readily form. And it, very importantly, for, for users who are analyzing this data in, in detail, uh, there's direct access to all the methodological data which explains any resources and methodology behind the data that we display. I think with that, I can leave you some contact details. You can email us directly with other, other questions or follow uh, our output through the OECD Twitter account and on our website as well. And I think with that, I can hand back to you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, David. Lara, please, can you share your screen? Yes. Um, hi, everyone. While my presentation is loading, my name is uh, Lara Plaritsche. I also work at the OECD and I'm presenting a second data set. Can you see my screen? Can you confirm? There we go. Now we can see it. Great. Okay, great. So the data set I am presenting to you today is called life measuring well-being and it is a data set that is all about how people are doing so whether life in all its multiple aspects is getting better for people um, for whom it is getting better and if we as societies have the resources to ensure the well-being of people and the planet is sustainable for future generations and this data set has actually just been launched on 9th of march so just this monday um, this is the first time we're presenting it to an audience, um, and it was alongside with the launch of our big flagship publication, How is Life? Measuring Wellbeing.
approach um, the house internally and externally to see um, which data providers um, have well-being data and we combine them in what we kind of call a supermarket of well-being data where you can pick and choose. So um, this includes some internal OECD data, but also data from outside providers. So we're using um, some data from Eurostat, some geospatial data, and some indicators that we ourselves are computing so that are unique to our database, for example, data from time use surveys, so how people spend their time and with whom they spend their time. All of this makes for um, more than 80 data points for um, up to 41 countries. So those are the 36 OECD members, including the European ones, um, Colombia, which is about to join a couple of partner countries, and the database goes back um, 15 years. So it covers the time period 2005 to 2019, although some indicators, the latest available year will be 2017. Um, here's the link under which you can access the database. And I want to spend just a few minutes to actually explain to you what we mean with people's well-being and how we can measure it. Um, so here you see an infographic on the OECD well-being framework, which also reflects what is covered in the database. So we usually distinguish between um, two things, current well-being and the resources that are needed to sustain current well-being over time. So here at the top, we see um, 11 dimensions of what we call well-being here and now. So those are really the areas of life that matter to people, that they say themselves are important to their quality of life and their experience. And those range from income and wealth, um, the housing conditions, uh, their knowledge and skills that they gain through the education system, the environmental quality they're exposed to, but also things like um, how good is their work-life balance, how socially connected or lonely do people feel, and how satisfied are they with their lives. In the database, um, for most of those indicators, you will find country averages, but wherever possible, we also um, distinguish between three types of inequalities. So there's inequalities between groups, so you can disaggregate by gender, age, um, and educational status. Um, we also have inequalities between top and bottom performers. So this could be, for example, income inequality, so the ratio of the richest 20 and the poorest 20% of the income distribution in the country, and people living in deprivation. So this could be people living in poverty, people that To, to illustrate this a little bit better. Um, and here, here at the bottom, we also um, look at the kind of systemic sources that help to sustain um, well-being over time. So those are a society's natural, economic, human, and social capital. And in natural capital, we could have things like um, a country's material footprint, their biodiversity resources, um, economic capital could be something like household debt, um, and um, produce assets, so kind of the infrastructure that a country produces, um, whereas um, human and social capital look at the cooperative norms, so trust in other people, um, trust in institutions, perceived government corruption, quality of institutions. So um, all of this well-being data can be used to find out how quality of life is in your country, for which population groups' life is getting better, and also as this competition is about linking this to other data sets, um, how a, a country's actual outcomes in terms of quality of life might relate to things like government performance, social protection systems, digital infrastructure, um, any of the you know databases that are out there on the list um, that this can be combined with. This is how the database on the OECD.stat suite looks like. Um, OED that, as David mentioned, is uh, the OECD's data warehouse. All of the data sets, including the health one that David has presented, will be found on here. Um, and under the heading Social Protection and Wellbeing, um, you will find, find um, several sub data sets of wellbeing, uh, one complete one, and several ones that are looking at the different types of inequalities uh, mentioned by name 
um, you will then have to select the year that you are interested in. Um, just to give uh, three very brief examples of how um, indicators that populate the dimensions of well-being can look like. You look at well-being today, one of the dimensions is subjective well-being. So how do people feel about their lives? Um, and here we see um, the mean values for life satisfaction. So how satisfied are people with their lives on a scale from zero to 10? And we can, uh, at a quick glance, see that life satisfaction is lower in countries such as Turkey, Lithuania, and Greece. Um, than it is compared to Aust uh, Austria, Ireland, Finland. Um, an example of um, inequalities between population groups. Um, so here in the case of gender uh, in different well-being areas, this is a graphic, a visualization from a recent well-being report. Here we can see all the well-being areas in We see that um, men um, are doing much better in terms of being paid for jobs and working less hours in uh, unpaid work, um, but they also have fewer social connections and are spending more hours um, in paid work at their jobs. This is an example of what I refer to as deprivations in well-being. You can see here the OECD average for a couple of our indicators. So we can see that 12% of the population live in relative income poverty, 7% um, report really low life satisfaction, and 9% they say they have no friends or family to turn to in times of need. And again, you can see all of those indicators for the 41 countries. Find out more information, um, read the entire report that has some visualizations that showcase what can be done with the database. You can go to um, this website here. There's an email address here to write any questions. And um, including, you know, if you need the database um, in a specific format that's uh, not accessible on OCD.7, we're very happy to provide that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Lara, okay, so I have a couple of questions. I have one question for uh, David. Is there any way to... Uh, David, uh, no? Hello, David? Hello. I didn't hear the question. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. I didn't hear the question. So, yes, the question is, uh, is there a way to automatically like access all this data? Like, well, through the, through the link that I showed you, there are several ways to go to get to the data. Through the main uh, OECD website, there'll be a link to the statistics and you can find health as one of the, the themes in the, in the main OECD docs and database or through the link that I, I, uh, I showed you, which will take you directly to, to the database as well. If you're talking about uh, okay. downloading okay. a lot of the data, then there are then there's a facility to bulk download uh, much of the data series as well. Okay, okay, great. Thank you, David. And then another question for, for you, Lara. Uh, like all this data is really interesting, but um, how would you align it with the different challenges? Like the first challenge. The fourth one, are Europe uh, fit for the digital age? Do you fit with all the challenges, with some of them specifically? And yeah. So I think they actually, because well being as probably has been visible from my presentation is so multidimensional and encompassing. It can could really fit to all the challenges in the sense that in terms of you know democracy we have data on civic engagement. I think that's challenge number three. Um, we have data on civic engagement but also trust institutions. Um, very clear linkage with the second challenge on an economy that works for people just because it is about people's well being and their final outcomes that often gets overlooked. Uh, when you just look at economic uh, data, 
and yeah, the the other two challenges then it's up to the to the creativity of the of the people participating in the challenge if if it can be linked to you know how digitally advances the country and what does that have to do with well being. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, so now we give the floor for uh, the Director General for Defense, Industry, and Space. So, Thomas, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, and uh, hello everyone. So I would like to give um, a, a short uh, overview of how you can use the uh, data coming from the EU satellites, uh, uh, the Copernicus program uh, and the Galileo, we will also just mention. Okay, let me see if um, I can share my screen now. Okay, hopefully it will show up now. You see something yes, it's working. All right, great. Yes. So I'm working for the completely new Director General of Defense Industry and Space. And we are running the, the, the two programs, uh, Copernicus and Galileo. I'd just like to mention that according to the Copernicus regulation, Copernicus shall monitor the Earth uh, for the protection of the environment and the efforts of civil protection security meaning that we can actually use the satellite images in a in a in a variety of ways uh, copernicus is a, is a european program so we own the satellites and we run these services and it's the largest program in the world to monitor our planet therefore it has been decided that the data will be free and open to all so that we can increase the use of these satellites uh, and, and the satellite images can be used by, by companies and authorities and, and individual individuals for, for various purposes. Now to and so um, our programs for startup companies to participate in. And I should also mention that Galileo is a positioning system. It's a state-of-the-art positioning system, a bit like the American GPS. Um, and sometimes you may need to combine the satellite images with positioning in order to get the information that you like to. In, in a very quick overview, uh, Copernicus um, uses both satellite images and data coming from ground stations that we call in situ data. And we have six uh, basic uh, or core services um, uh, which are used to monitor the state of the oceans, land, the atmosphere, uh, uh, emergencies, and, and so on. They're operated by different organizations so that you can, you can use the, the satellite data in a variety of ways. Uh, now, to make it easier for users to access the data, there is something called the DS, uh, the Data and Information Access Service, which provides uh, a bit of a better interface and also user support so, so that you can so you understand what you can download and how to use it. We're also looking at uh, other layers um, uh, to make it even easier to access the data. We can come back to that in the autumn. Uh, oops. Now, um, all these different ways that you can use the satellite data um, are, are shown here in this slide that you can use it for urban planning, for transport, for tourism, forestry, uh, uh, disaster management, and so on. Uh, of course, the satellite image only doesn't provide perhaps all the data you need, so you can combine it with for example, in agriculture, you can uh, um, use the land parcel identification database, um, or you can use the positioning system when it comes to disaster management uh, or, or something like that. Um, and it could also be that you use um, databases showing the density of population in certain areas, and then you can lay that on top of the satellite images to, to create a new service. Um, if you want more examples of how to use satellite images, there, there is um, a publication with 99 uh, use cases that I can recommend on this page. Now, a very quick overview of the various um, 
access points to get to the data is found here. So you have five different DS providers. Uh, there's an overview uh, on this link. And you also have uh, several conventional data access hubs as well as Earth Engine and the Amazon Web Services. Here is something really useful if you are going to uh, take a deep dive into, uh, into satellite images. We have just launched a completely new online course, which makes it so much easier to understand how to get the satellite data and how to process it and how to make useful information out of it. So you can enroll to this massive online course uh, for free and follow it every week uh, from, from, I think it was from last week and then uh, 10 weeks on. And if you manage to build a very interesting application, then why not start a business? And uh, that's why we have, um, have several types of supports. Uh, for example, the incubation program where companies can get 50,000 euros to boost uh, the, the local company. And you also get uh, qualified business uh, coaching and access to, to interesting meetings with investors and so on. And here are a couple of links uh, to make it easier to find the Copernicus data, Copernicus EU. So thank you very much from, uh, from, from my side. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take those. Okay. Yes, uh, for the time being, we don't have uh, any further questions. But uh, thank you. Uh, very much for your presentation. It was I hope it was really useful, and I'm sure it was for for participants. In case like if you have any questions in the in the future, you can just contact us, and we will contact them to to see how we can uh, help you to exploit this data. And uh, we hope you submit your application uh, soon. And uh, please submit it before the third of May. So have a wonderful afternoon.